Hello and welcome to your THP online community. I am Dallas, your online community pastor. Today, you'll be hearing a message from special guest David Garcia of Ministries 128. The message is called, The Most Important Teaching That Jesus Ever Taught. We hope that this message not only encourages you, but challenges you. We firmly believe that things spoken here on Sundays and Wednesdays are not just for those who are able to join us, but also for members of our THP online community. Would you stand with me, please? We want to read our text. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20. If we can put that up on the screen, please. I want to talk to you on the most important teaching Jesus ever taught. It's going to be a feature on my next book. I'm going to do a book called The Most Important Teachings Jesus Ever Taught. But I believe this is the principal one. He repeated it in Matthew 7. And we all know this. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Read the next part with me. Teaching them, say it slowly, teaching them to observe all things. How many things? All things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. <clears throat> By the way, there is a difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching declares. Teaching dissects. Jesus did more teaching than what he did preaching. We think preaching is yelling hallelujah and teaching is monotone. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you cannot make disciples unless you teach. That's why I commend your Bible school. Now let's get to our text. Matthew chapter 6 verses 46 to 49. Excuse me. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, <clears throat> and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Would you bow your heads and pray with me right now? Father, I ask that the presence of God would just increase in our midst right now. And I pray that as I speak, God, People will take note and make decisions as to what kind of Christian commitment they really have. Would you lift up your hands up right now? Just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, as Pastor David preaches, would you speak to me? Would you correct me if I need it? Would you inspire me? Heal me? But whatever you do, don't let me leave here in the same condition I came. And I'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Two things I want you to take away with you today. Two key takeaways. Are we up there? Okay. Key takeaway number one is Jesus here teaches that there will be three kinds of people in the future established church. How many of you realize by the waving of your hands that Jesus already knew there was going to be a church? Amen? He's teaching us that in the future, in his future, our present, that whenever you get people in a church building or in an organized church, there will only be three kinds of people. Look at me, everybody. You need to decide what number you are. Because you are one of these. And they're not all good. You know how we say, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Well, as I've been traveling the states and other countries, I have noticed one of the things that the Lord is putting in my heart is that he's going after the lukewarm. 
Jesus said, what does the Bible say in Revelation? The lukewarm I'll spew out of my mouth. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. I'm so burdened. Vomit goes down. The Lord told me, David, I want you to leave your pastorate because I'm going to use you to save the saved. Y'all missed that in the back. <clears throat> I'm going to use you to save people who think they're really saved, who think they're born again, and they're not. And when the Lord comes, I remember Billy Graham saying what I'm going to tell you this long time ago. He said, if the rapture came today in the United States, only 30% of American Christians will go. That's sad. So the Lord says <clears throat> here, there will be in the future church three kinds of people. Please decide which one you are. But key takeaway number two is really heavy on my heart. We are guaranteed, read it with me, we are guaranteed to overcome any crisis in life if we obey what Jesus said. And I'm talking about any crisis. Let me quote an Old Testament scripture now before I forget it. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. We have so many Christians that are so dependent on Jesus to stop the flood. God, I'm going through a crisis. Would you, would you see me through it? Yet in this message, God makes it clear, I've given you the tools to overcome every single possible problem that will come your way. Amen? Amen. So let's get down to business. Number one, the deceived in the church. <clears throat> Everybody say deceived. deceived. Say it again, deceived. deceived. These are people who think they're saved. These are people who go to church or don't go to church. Well, no, deceived in the church, they, they'll go to church. You know, in America, by the way, and I was talking to Pastor Daniel Norris about this, the average church, and Pat Shastlein, who's who calls me dad, by the way, uh, tells me that the average church, people will do two hits a month, <clears throat> a Sunday morning and maybe a Wednesday. That's it. And if it rains... They act like they never, Southerners will act like they never seen rain in their life. Yeah. Yet they'll spend three hours tailgating to see LSU play the Gators. Are you with me? And then sit four hours in a game, hooping and hollering in the church, touchdown! And yet when the worship goes on, let's praise God. You know, like this. Something is dramatically wrong in our country. We need revival. Yes. The answer to this country, I agree with pastor, is not the elephant or the donkey. It is the lamb. It's Jesus. Well, let's get down to business. The deceived in the church. Let's break down verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? So first of all, these are people who talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They speak Christianese. They've got it down pat, you know. We'll see somebody at the restaurant. Hey, how are you? Praise God, hallelujah, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We've got the language down pat. We've got it. We're, we're experts at it, especially here in the South. And by the way, I love the South. Both my kids married Southerners, and I am forever grateful they did. I'd be nervous if they married somebody from New York City. Good. People will talk the talk, but it doesn't resonate with truth. Secondly, they want Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. <clears throat> Only early in your Christian walk can you be what the Bible talks about early, a carnal Christian. But you cannot stay a carnal Christian. Carnal Christian means Jesus is Savior, but you got so much junk from the past. Yep. The junk eventually has to leave. Either he's Lord or he's not. That's right. Amen? Just a thought. Just a thought. And I want to ask you something. 
Is he Lord over every area of your life? I find it amazing that American Christians will tithe when they have the money. That's not tithing, that's tipping. You tip Starbucks, you tithe to the Lord. Now, let me explain something so that you're not under condemnation. It took us, we built a 2,300 seat dome building. It took us 10 years to raise $400,000 and three years to raise 3.4 million with regular people. No huge offerings. We taught our people, get out of debt. We taught them how to get out of debt. I I don't have the time to do that now. And then I said something that blew my elders and board members away. I got up and began to say, listen, if you can't afford... You see, we have been so disobedient to God, we owe uh, Brother MasterCard and Sister Visa more than what we owe Jesus. We owe them half our lives. And so I began to say, listen, why don't you begin to give 1%? And you're going to notice that in a few months you're going to have more income. And then you'll give 3%. Within a year you can be tithing. So for those of you who are not tithing, I don't want you to feel condemned. I want you to feel convicted. This is a great church. And you're not giving what you're supposed to. You're not contributing towards the lights and everything. And I understand. I understand what debt is about. I used to be $65,000 in debt. The phone would ring and I would get terrorized. But now I'm completely out of debt. My house is mine. The cars are mine. And and, and there's no greater feeling in the world. But I did what the Bible says. And then as I did it, I taught my church to do it. Now you have a lot of people back at Grace World Outreach Church in Brooksville who they're out of debt. Amen? Because we just don't say Jesus my Savior, He is Lord. Number three, they allow their confession to sabotage their obedience. One of your worst enemies is in between your lips. Your lips. I was just telling Holly today that, you know, her little beautiful little girl, by the way, is going to turn two soon. I said, don't let people tell you that terrible twos are coming. Why do we curse people that way? No, it's the terrific twos. I've, I've heard people say, ooh, you got, your little boy is so good looking, he's going to have to beat him off with a stick. You're putting a curse on that little boy. Proverbs 18, 21. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And we hang ourselves by our tongue. We sabotage our obedience. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. For example... Somebody really hurts you. And you come up with things like this. Well, let's put the next frame up. You know, I can't forgive. Ain't no way in the world I'm going to forgive. It's not my nature to forgive. My wife is very forgiving, but I'm not very forgiving. You have just hung yourself with your tongue. You have just sabotaged the word of God because of your upbringing or whatever else it is. You have just crucified the Word of God by saying, this is not the way I am. Well, really, really, Bubba, well, drop dead already. Die to yourself. This is the way your new nature is. Don't confess that your new nature is similar in any way to your old nature. Because if you say, I'm a new creation in Christ, and then you say, I have a hard time forgiving, you have just sabotaged the work of God in your life. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. At eight years old, uh, and I'm saying this for the benefit of a few of you who need this. At eight years old, I was molested by an adult man. And then he made me watch his parents in the act. I'm being very careful. I grew up with such a spirit of lust in my life. Such a powerful lust that followed me throughout the years. The first three years of my marriage, I was an adulterer. I used to travel for the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, people that put in escalators and elevators in cities. I saw a lot of New Orleans go up. Are you with me? And, and, and during that time, I, w- I, would, I was a whoremonger. No excuse. 
But God saved my soul because my wife's Puerto Rican grandmother wouldn't give up praying and I had to surrender to Jesus in a hotel room by myself, June of 1974. So I want to tell you something. I no longer am that person. Here's the key. And you need, I don't know if you want to just get the, re, get, get the download the recording later. But you need to forgive by faith. Yeah. <clears throat> just forgive by faith. Say, well, that's not my nature. Disregard your nature. Die to that nature. We have to drop dead to that old nature. And we have to let the new nature come up. Yeah. Now, here's the key. Please get this. When you forgive... You're supposed to remember. The gospel according to Satan says forgive and forget. No, that's wrong. You're supposed to remember but without the pain. Say that with me. You're supposed to remember but without the pain. Why? So that you can help somebody else in the highway of life. You can tell them, I can help you to forgive. I was there. This is my story. Now let me tell you that Jesus says you can forgive. Yes. The Holy Spirit will help you to do everything in the Word of God. But if you confess, believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that I can't do it, you are deceived into thinking you're really a Christian. Yeah. I love the way you're shouting this morning. Don't go around saying, that's not the way I am. Your new nature says that's the way you are. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? The fourth thing I want to tell you. Why does Jesus say, Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you do not do the things which I say. I remember in Zimbabwe, we were missionaries there. And we were staying at a houseboat at, at like a resort, you can say. It was a... You know, you, you and the animals were all part of the same park, you can say. And in our houseboat, uh, there was a hippo. By the way, hippos kill more people than lions and everything else in Africa. And my, my little two-year-old at the time, David, who was born, my son is a real African-American, okay? He was born there. Well, we couldn't find him. I said, Nelly, is David with you? No, I thought he was with you. You know, all the OMGs, everything else came out, and we're looking, we're going. I'm about ready to jump in the water, but I did think twice about that. And, and, and all of a sudden, she went, she went, David, David. I said, what, what? He goes, Where, where's our son, our son? I said, I don't know, I don't know. You know, when people are in an emergency, they'll say something twice. God forbid there's a fire in, the, in, in this building. Somebody will say, fire, fire. Somebody else say, where, where? <laughs> there, there. Run, run. That's the way we are. And you know what the Lord is saying here? The Lord is saying you use the double emphasis when there's an emergency in your life. But when after I take care of the emergency, you go back to being on the throne of your heart. Oh, come on. You go back to taking care of business. So don't call me Lord just for the emergencies. Call me Lord even when it isn't an emergency, all the time. Can I get away? Are you with me? So there's the deceived in the church. Number two, put your seatbelt on. This is the one where you want to be the disciples in the church. You want to be a disciple. I love the healing place because you not only go after souls, you believe in discipling those souls. We need to make disciples. Verse 47 and 48 is so critical. I want you to note three things. Everybody say discipled. And I want you to understand. I want, I, I, my prayer is that most of you are in this category. First of all, note the degrees of obedience. Say that with me. Note the degrees of obedience. There are three levels of obedience. I could have said three levels of faith. Jesus said in verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them. So under the degrees of obedience, number one, we see coming. Everybody say coming. Say it again, coming. Now, 
let's use coming as far as coming to church and d during uh, tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday, coming into the presence of God. All right? Now, nobody can make you come. Now, we can do good works for you. By the way, study, do a study on good works. We should be mowing lawns, doing things for people in the hospital. And when they say, how much do I owe you? You tell them you don't owe me anything. Well, surely there's something I can do for you. You can come to my church, the healing place, on Sunday morning. I'll meet you there. And then you wait, wait there in the foyer and, wait, and, and, and sit with them. Yeah. Amen? Right. Now, let's get back to coming. You can't force somebody to come. You can entice them. You can do something. Most American Christians in America are on level one. Right. I went to church today. I did my duty. I went to church. Wonderful. Did you get anything out of it? What did he preach on? Preach? I don't know. The, one, the joke about the farmer and the pig. That was real funny. <laughs> well, in this church, you're going to get more than farmer and the pig. Yes. Level number two, hearing. Everybody say hearing. hearing. There are two types of hearers. Decide which one you are. There is a passive hearer and an aggressive hearer. Okay? Let me tell you a couple of things about a passive hearer. A passive hearer does not take any notes. Why should she? She don't, she don't intend to do it anyway. Never downloads the message. Why should he? He's not going to hear it. Uh, the passive hearer has no intention of doing what he heard. Then you have an aggressive hearer. The aggressive hearer takes notes or has somebody else take the notes for them. Downloads the message afterwards because I'm going to squeeze the juice out of that message. How many of you are like me? The first time it shocks you. The second time you, it starts sinking in. And the third time you might decide to do it. Are you with me? God wants aggressive hearers. By the way, the passive hearer is, is easily distracted. The aggressive hearer is, has such focus on what's going on. But even that's not good enough. Coming, hearing, doing. Everybody say doing. doing. Say it again, doing. doing. This is a person who applies the Word of God. Now, in Bible hermeneutics or in Bible uh, interpretation, the epistles interpret the Gospels. They elaborate more on the Gospels. <clears throat> and there is a scripture <coughs> that if we don't understand it, James 1 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Finish it. Deceiving, deceiving yourself. Why, why would the Holy Spirit say deceiving yourself? <clears throat> because, and you might, you might want to, again, this is, this is one of those pearls that you might want to get. God will never ask you to do anything that the Holy Spirit will not help you to obey it. <clears throat> Can I say that again? God will not ask you to do anything that the Holy Spirit will not help you to do it. He will. That's called grace. There's two types of grace. Caddis, grace. There's saving grace. In other words, we, we, we have unmerited love and favor from God. The blood of Jesus takes away our sins. But then grace also means the enabling power of God. Say that with me. The enabling power of God. And this is, what, this is what we're lacking in America today. Why would you say that I can't do that command when God says all the help of heaven is available to you? So we'd rather say, no, nah, that ain't me. Nah, I'm good. You ever hear that? I'm good. I'm fine. I don't need to do that. Yes, you do. If it's in the Bible, you need to do it. Amen? So... We deceive ourselves when we come to a false conclusion that what God commands, I don't necessarily have to do. Can I get away? Are you with me? That's why he says deceiving yourselves. <clears throat> Amen? So note the degrees of obedience. Now, let's break scripture down further. Number two, note the description of an overcomer. Note the description. Put that word down, overcomer, because that's where you want to be. The description of an overcomer. If you were asleep this morning so far, wake up. This is it. This is how you can have victory. 
He says, for whoever comes to me, hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house. Like a man building a house. Wow. Number one, the house is your Christian life. The house is your Christian life. And your decisions and your actions affect the stability of your spiritual house. Amen? In Florida, we have sinkholes. I'm talking about a hole opens up in the yard and your house goes right down. So you don't want to come to Florida unless God leads you. And the cockroaches are so big they have landing strips. Are you with me? (laughs) Secondly, he's like a man building a house who laid the foundation. Well, what's the foundation? Go to the next frame. The foundation is your decisions. Everybody say decisions. The foundation is the decisions that you make in your life. Now, I'm not talking about somebody growing up with beat up at babies and things like that. Some, some of us grew up in some horrible say, a situation. However, most of the problems in our life are the results of our decisions. Can I speak to you? Hood talk for a moment. Don't blame the white man. Don't blame the Republicans. Don't blame the Democrats. You need to look in the mirror and you need to blame yourself for the situation I'm in. Because we have a sovereign God and he has spoken to you and you got saved or at least you turned your life over to him. And he's a great God. But we are in the mess we are because of the decisions we made. And I'm not condoning the adulterous husband who cheated on you and left you for your best friend. So a life lesson. We have to make decisions based on the Word of God. This Bible, this Bible is your decision maker. Whether you have a leather one like me or an electronic one. That's what you have to make. You young, you young students, you got to make your decisions on the Word of God. And if you meet a guy that says, that's nothing but a bunch of junk, run. Just run. And by the way, let me give you a hint. The devil sends the most gorgeous looking guys. He sends no ugly guys. And for you guys, he sends gorgeous women. Are you with me? Because he's an angel of light. He will not send somebody that makes you disgusted. He'll send you somebody to go, wow. And your girlfriends will say, that's the captain of the football team, man. He wants your number. He, he wants your number. If you don't give him your number, I'll give him mine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan is an angel of light. And we need to understand that. We need to make decisions on the word of God. Is he a born again Christian? Uh, no. Uh, stay away. Can't touch this. He's not a born again Christian. First Corinthians 6.6. 6. Are you with me? If you're not saved, you have no business. Light cannot fellowship with darkness. Then that's Second Corinthians 6.6. 6. Are you with me? So that's one of the things you'll learn in, my, in, in the book. One of the things that we can talk about. So next life lesson. You and I are the product of our decisions. So we need to make Bible-based decisions. Next frame. Life lesson. We need to beware of decisions that will put a sinkhole in our foundation and potentially destroy our spiritual house. Give me a wave if you know a couple of Christians who have shipwrecked their lives. They're not even serving God anymore. Can I see your hands? Don't be scared. I'm not going to call on you, all right? I... Pastors of great churches falling away. You're finding out why. Next friend, number three, to do this. Now, if you're going to put your decisions on the Word of God, to do this, you have got to dig past your self will. You've got to dig past. You've got to go from here down there. And I have got to dig past, by the way, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I can dig past my self-will, say it with me, by the grace 
and enabling power of the Holy Spirit. See, I can't do my will and God's will at the same time. One of them's going to suffer. Can I get a witness to somebody? In other words, I got to dig past my feelings, but I just don't feel like doing that. Who asked you? Dig. I have to dig past my upbringing. I wasn't brought up that way. See, I was born up a Roman Catholic. Hey, I'm in, I'm in RC country over here. You guys don't even say counties. You say parishes. Are you with me? You got to dig past that. By the way, my father was a Freemason. And he brought me to a spiritist temple. And I got demon possessed. So here I am. I had adultery. And I had demon possession. And God saved me from both of them. By the way, if you are in Freemasonry, get out. Get out and get out now. Albert Pike wrote in one of the great books of the Freemasonry, which you need to understand, the light is Lucifer. The light is Lucifer. That's in Morals and Dogma. Check it out. The light is Lucifer. I've never met a Freemason whose family didn't didn't suffer from sickness, deformities, and all kind of hell in their life. In other words, you got to dig past. You may have to dig past Freemasonry. You may have to dig past all kind of things. And become a doer of the word of God. Now, some people, when they dig, and I got a couple of things here. They say, Jesus, I love you so much. This is how much I love you. I am going to dig past my self-will. I'm holding a teaspoon, a plastic. That's how much I love you, Lord. Well, maybe maybe a little bit more. Uh, Let me get a tablespoon. Yeah, that's right. I love you a lot, you know. Uh, Pastor preached a great message. So let me dig a Listen. These things are not going to help you. You need to get a shovel. In my case, I use nitroglycerin. I don't know if you're anything like me, but I was stubborn. I was set in my ways. I'm looking around. I see 95% of you are the same way. You need to dig past your self-will. Amen? So, note the degrees of obedience. Note the description of an overcomer. Number three, note the deluge. Everybody say deluge. Or the flood. Get this. Or the flood that oppresses. Put your seatbelts on right now. What did Jesus say in verse 48b? Let's put number one. He says, and when the flood arose. Do you see that? I wish he said, if, if by chance a flood arose. Now, look at me. That's not what he said. He said, when the flood arose. So in other words, floods are inevitable. The inevitability of the flood. The inevitability of the crisis. Look at me, everybody. Floods, crisis, problems are going to come your way, and there is nothing you can do to avoid them. We have whole sections in Christian bookstores who are deceived How to avoid floods and rivers. Let me give you the parable. I'll use uh, the parable of the superhero pastor. You know, a Marvel, uh, Iron Man pastor. Super pastor. They call you at the middle of the night. When I was a young pastor, that was me. Hello, pastor. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Did, did, I, did I wake you? Oh, no. I was, what? I, I was waiting for your call. What do you think we're doing at 3 in the morning? I'm not talking about lambs. I'm not talking about baby Christians. They can call me anytime. But she says, oh, Pastor David, w- would you come to my house now? There is a flood coming my way. And I prayed, God, move that flood to the right three miles or to the left two miles, and the flood is still coming. And then I did what the Word and Faith guy do. And by the way, I believe in Word and Faith. And and, and I said, flood, I bind you in Jesus' name. Stop. Flood keeps coming. (laughs) Finish this with me. Jesus said, and when. So if he said when, you ain't going to stop the flood by huffing and puffing and anointing and everything else. It is going to come. Are you with me? 
Do you remember I quoted that scripture? When the, the, um, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. This is the standard. Yeah. The standard is I've equipped you. The prophet was prophesying of the day that Jesus would come to teach us how to overcome floods. You overcome them by digging past your flesh, digging past your self-will, digging past your own nature, and putting your decisions on the Word of God. Can I get a witness, somebody? Are you with me? And so she says, Pastor, you've got to come. And so in my young pastoring days, I would put on my Iron Man costume on, and I would fly. I put on my Superman, and I would come, and I would land. She goes, oh, Pastor, thank you. And I said, don't worry about it. God bless you. See, because at that time, I was so codependent on people to love me and need me. Are you with me? And the flood would come, and she would say, please don't let me. I'm not going to let you go. Please, I'm not going to let you go. And the flood would go, wham, and it would hit me and leave me half discombobulated. And I said, I got to go now. No, 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 please stay just in case. I got to go because you see this lady in the front row, she's calling me now, and I've got to go over there. And she's saying, help, pastor. Stay, pastor. Help, pastor. Stay. So I would say, hold on a second. And I would stick my leg out and just hold my leg. And she would say, stay, help, stay. And wham, I would get hit again. And then I said, I got to leave both of you. No, but then that lady's gone. So, so now I say, take, take my hand. And it would happen again. And after I was all defeated, discombobulated, ready to leave the ministry, the board got together and decided, let's hire an assistant pastor so we can kill him as well. <laughs> Are you with me? That's why a lot of churches function that way. Look at me, please. Look at me, please. Hear me. Hear me. Pastor's job is not to stop your rivers. Pastor's job is to pass out shovels every Sunday and Wednesday. Amen? That's good preaching, even if you don't recognize it. Pastor is to pass out shovels. You know the old adage, you can teach a man to fish, or you can, or you can give a man fish, or you can give him a fishing pole. I'm giving you a fishing pole. And so what happens is that we have raised the generation of Christians in America codependent on a human pastor, almost to the point of worshiping. And you're not doing your job if you don't stop my rivers. My job is not to stop your rivers. Pastor Scott's job is to give you a shovel and teach you how to dig deep. And then you, you'll survive. Let's get to point number three here. Note the deluge that oppresses. The third one, next frame. That's it. The inevitability of the floods and when the flood arose. The intensity of the floods. The stream beat vehemently against that house. So look at me. Get this, please. Not only are problems prophesied by Jesus that they will hit you, but they will hit you hard. What does vehemently mean? It means real hard. <laughs> real hard. Next frame, there are four types of floods. I want you to get this. Basically, four categories of floods, crises, or problems that will hit you at any age. And they're going to hit us and hit us hard. The first one is tribulations. Everybody say tribulation. This is John 16, 33. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have much tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yeah. Now, now please listen to me. The Lord overcomes the world through his church by teaching us this scripture to dig deep and then you don't have to worry about the flood. Amen? Amen. The second type of flood is temptations. Now, I don't have to tell you what temptations are. Amen? Temptations is when you get allured or attracted to disobey the Word of God, be it financial, be it sexual, be it with your temper, you lose your temper. 
Amen? Let me just pause here for a second and just come down here with the mirror because it's got to be up here for a reason. James chapter 1 says in verse 22, But be doers of the word of God and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. You know, you're getting dressed and, oh God, I got makeup over here. I got shaving cream over here. You know, I, I need to wipe that off before I leave. Are you with me? And, and he observes himself and he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. It's happened to all of us. I just use shaving cream. You're shaving half of your face, the phone rings. Your father's being rushed to the hospital and you just go out and you go out in the street with a half of shaving lather on your face. Are you with me? Ladies, you can just use your imagination. Why do you forget? Because you focus so much on the emergency than what you were seeing in the mirror. Say this with me. The Bible reflects the real person of who I am. So when you read the Bible, it shows you who you really are. And God expects you to take immediate, say it with me, immediate corrective action. Immediate. In other words, don't put it off. If you get tempted, don't put it off. James 4, verse 6 and 7, resist the devil and he will flee. Well, I've been resisting, he ain't fleeing. Well, before that it says, submit yourself therefore to God. Yeah. Resist the devil. Because God's not a liar. So if the, devil ain't re- if the devil's not fleeing, then I have not been submitting. Amen? So if the Word of God shows me that, I need to take corrective action. Right. So if ever you have been resisting the devil and, and you're still encountering problems, go back to base one. Have I submitted everything to God? Have I given God? Let me look at Holy Spirit. Show me. Because I'm being deluged by tribulation and now temptation. Amen? The third type of flood is trepidation. Everybody say trepidation. Trepidation. Number three, trepidations. Now that simply means fears. There are all kinds of trepidation. The fear of running out of money. The fear of getting older. My kids are growing. I'm out of the house. They're going to stick me in a nursing home. God, what's going to happen? Look at me. Look at me. Stop, 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 stop. Don't you think God loves you more than your kids? Our future is not in the hands of our children or grandchildren. They are in the hands of Jehovah God who loves you and sent this son to die for you. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will cripple you. And there are so many rivers of fear. Half the movies out there are caused to bring you into fear. And then number four, tragedies. Tragedies. Now, I I just want to spend a little time to look at me, everybody. Tragedy is going to come. Look at me. You can't avoid tragedy. The first one, death. I'm married 47 years. I have insurance. I made provision. But you know, if the Lord doesn't come back soon... One day, I may either bury my wife or she may bury me. Look at me, please. Look at me. Life is not over when your husband dies. Life's not over because your wife died. Some of you, we were made to outlive our children. Our children were made to outlive us. But some of us have lost a child. There's about two people in here right now. You've lost a child. And you wonder, well, why didn't God stop this from happening? The Lord says, I did stop it. I told you to dig deep. A river of tragedy is going to come your way. And you need to plow deep, lay your foundation on the rock, and realize, I need to keep serving God. I need to raise my kids to die and go to heaven. Because this world is temporary. We're not here forever. You know why the planets are out there and the solar systems and all that? That's going to be our playground. We don't live for today. We live for that day. 
when God takes us home and eternity is forever and ever and ever. Somebody put it, I, I, I had a new Christian tell me, how long is eternity? I said, uh, do you like eagles? He goes, yeah. Imagine Mount Everest. Is that high? He goes, that's real high. Imagine an eagle goes on Mount Everest and begins to peck away. By the time he reaches the bottom, millions of years later, eternity just started. And God says in my word, dig deep because you live forever. Keep your eyes on eternity, not the temporal. Life's not over when somebody dies. Life's not over when somebody divorces you. But God, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and she still left me. He still left me. Jesus said it was going to happen. My life is over. No, it's not. It is over for the weak, carnal believer. It's not over for the overcomer. You've got to dig deep. You've got to press in. Yeah. It happens. Jesus said when the flood arose. Amen? Disease is going to happen. I think the devil sends these diseases, but it's going to happen. Yeah. You need to meet it, greet it, and defeat it in the name of Jesus. Amen. By the way, speak to your disease. Don't say... Father, I come to you, and tomorrow I'm having an MRI, and you know, they discovered. Would you stop it already? Didn't you ever read in Mark 11? Speak to the mountain. Command it to move, and it will move. And if it doesn't move, then God will show you at the end of your life why it didn't move. But in the meantime, I'm going to be a doer of the Word of God. He said to speak to that cancer in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to speak to it. Are you with me? Tragedy is going to come. Unemployment. You know, it is to work for a place 25 years and they give you a pink slip, and empty out your locker, and you're gone. Rebellious children happen. I've seen some of the godliest families have the most ungodliest children. It's going to happen. Don't let it overcome you. Addictions. We have an opioid crisis in America. All kind of people, church kids, are getting strung out on drugs. It's going to happen. Don't let it take away faith. You know what people do? Lord, you promise when the enemy comes in like a flood that you will lift up a standard against him. This is God's answer. I did in Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49. I showed you how to dig deep and be a mature disciple that no matter what happens, I'm going to keep serving Jesus. Is there anybody else here in the house today that you're going to keep serving Jesus? Let me see your hands. Hallelujah. Yes, so here's a life lesson for all of the board members and the elders. Next frame, please. All of the elders and the board members, I want you to see, note the dependability of the rock. It says, and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Please say that with me. Could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Please note, the problem went away by itself. I'm using an imaginary conversation. Your wife and you are having coffee, and there's a boom on the, on the house. They say, honey, what was that? Oh, that was just a trial. But we're founded on the rock. We have dug deep, and as for me and my house, we're serving God. We have dug deep. Are you with me? Yep. I am not saying... That losing a wife or a son is easy. I'm saying that the grace of God, if you apply what Jesus said, that's why I call this the most important teaching Jesus ever taught. Dig deep and the river will bounce off of you. Amen? Yep. So we need to understand Jesus is the rock and the rock's also the word of God. Life lesson, next frame. All the board members, all the leaders, if you disciple somebody, as leaders, we are to prepare and equip people to overcome the floods and the storms that life presents, not to always be the lifeguard who rescues them. Right. Codependent pastors, and you don't have one, uh, love people needing them. Right. Wise pastors love when people dig deep and get themselves out of the hole. Yes. Can I get away from somebody? Amen. Number three, and I finish with this. The defeated in the church. Next frame. The defeated in the church. 
May I qualify this by saying that these people are saved? But they're always up and they're always down. They're always up and they're always down. Do you know? Do you, no hands, please. Do you know people like that? Every church got them. Brother Morrow gets up and says, hey, turn around while we sing this song. Greet one another in the love of Jesus. And, and you're greeting people and here comes that lady. And you go, oh, God. Oh, God. How are you? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Listen, I got a pain over here, and my son, and the dog bit the cat, and you're so sorry you said, how are you? <laughs> Saved, yes. Eternally a baby Christian, absolutely. And you can't stay that way. Look at verse 49. These have, number one, opportunity with God. Why do I say opportunity? It says, but he who heard and did nothing. Say that with me. He who heard and did nothing. What level of faith is that? What level of obedience is heard? Number two. They, you can't hear if you didn't come. Amen? They heard, but they didn't. What didn't they do? They didn't dig deep. They didn't look in the mirror and correct themselves by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So secondly, these have opposition to God. How do they oppose God? Because he's like a man building a house without a foundation. Everybody say without a foundation. They did not put their decisions on the word of God. They put their decisions on family tradition, on religion, what their friends thought. You young students, don't you ever... Make decisions based upon what everybody else is saying and everybody else is doing. You ever hear that? Everybody's doing it. Please look at me. That's a lie. Everybody's not doing it. Yeah. Right. Amen? Yeah. Life lesson. Next frame. I believe these are saved people, but they're in danger of being lukewarm. Say this with me. Partial obedience is disobedience. Yeah. Come on, let me hear you. Partial obedience is disobedience. So these have opportunity in God. What opportunity did they have? To hear the word of God, dig deep and do it. But they heard and didn't do it. So these have opposition to God. It's like a man building a house. But he didn't have the foundation of Bible decisions. They didn't have the Bible decisions. So thirdly, these have oppression from Satan. Say that with me. These have oppression from Satan. Against which the stream beat vehemently. And immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is why people out there say, I ain't going to church. They're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites in the church. Give me a wave if you've heard that. I always tell them, we got room for one more. <laughs> We're all in the struggle together. See, leaders learn this. This is what makes people call church people hypocrites. They're always up and down. You hear unsaved people say, I have more stability in my life than those so-called Christians. Amen? And they are the number one reason why people don't go to our church. Bow your heads right now. Can I have brother plays a keyboard? Come join me. Just a keyboard, that's all. Father, in Jesus' name, move powerfully right now. Move in power right now. I pray for an, a response right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this message. At the end of this message, David prayed for everyone in the congregation. He asked them which of the three groups did they belong to? Were they one of the deceived? Did they talk the talk but maybe didn't walk the walk of the Christian life? Were they one of the discipled but they've been hurt and wounded? Or were they one of the defeated, someone who was constantly going through ups and downs and had no stability in their life? Today, we ask that if you have found yourself to be in one of those three groups, we would like to pray with you. Feel free to email us at mediahub at thpshreveport.com with your response to this message and let us partner with you in prayer. Thank you so much for taking time to be part of our THP Online community. You can find out more about The Healing Place by visiting our website, thpshreveport.com.